webinar for the month of uh, rheumatology. And we are very fortunate today to have uh, Dr. Asma as our chairperson for today and Prof. Sharul as our speaker. So a bit about Dr. Asma. She's a consultant rheumatologist in uh, Hospital Tuanku Jaffa, Seremban. And she is currently the president of the Malaysian Society of Rheumatology. She has played a pivotal role in the development of our latest rheumatology CPGs, as well as organizing workshops and symposiums pertaining to rheumatology, as well as being the principal investigators of several studies. Without further ado, let us welcome Dr. Asma. Hi, uh, Assalamualaikum Warahmatullah and a very good afternoon. Welcome everyone to another of our medical webinar uh, organized by a Malaysian College of Physician. Um, thank you very much for uh, College of Physician for inviting us and rheumatology uh, to, to organize, uh, to present or to talk on uh, several topics in the month of uh, December. So today's topic is another very important topic. Uh, we can't go, uh, 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 oh, I mean, was that uh, rheumatology is synonymous with uh, several different um, types of autoantibodies, but most importantly is when to order, why we order, and once we got the result is how to interpret. Okay, so today's topic is autoantibody in rheumatology, how to interpret. To deliver the talk, uh, we'd like to invite uh, professor, Associate Professor Sharul Shazliana Vitisharil. She's a consultant rheumatologist from uh, PPUKM. Okay, uh, she's an experienced rheumatologist. She has taught many. She has written plenty, and she's also Malaysian Society rheumatologist treasurer. So, without further ado, uh, Prof. Sharul, uh, the the platform is yours. Thank you, Dr. Asma. Uh, thank you, uh, College of Physicians, for inviting me um, to give a bit of uh, talk as well as um, share some of the experience. Uh, so I know that autoantibodies, um, I mean, we have a lot and sometimes it can be very overwhelming in terms of uh, interpretation. Uh, and so today I hope um, this session will probably at least assist um, in um, uh, correlate the antibodies um, with um, the uh, patient clinically. Okay. Um, so these are the outline of my talk today. So first, of course, we need to know where uh, do these autoantibodies uh, are coming from. So we will be looking back into our physiology years, um, many, many years ago, or even decades, <laughs> okay? And then we'll go through the uh, diagnostic use of these autoantibodies and what are the pitfalls. And of course, as a clinician, um, we need to make a clinical interpretation based on the results. And finally, uh, I think everybody need to be keep in touch with the updated uh, uh, research. So I will... Uh, enlighten some of the um, uh, pipelines uh, in the uh, autoantibodies development. Okay, to start off with the pathogenesis. Um, so, um, of course, um, pathogenesis of autoimmune disease is very complex, uh, and um, most of them are still not well uh, understood. Uh, so this is an oversimplified on how uh, autoantibodies are produced. So of course, it starts off with an individual with the uh, genetically predisposed to autoimmunity. Uh, so when this um, individual um, interacts with uh, um, external triggers or even internal, uh, so the externals commonly infection, these are very common, especially with the COVID pandemic, uh, chemicals, and hormones. So this um, interaction um, can actually um, induce um, dysregulation in your immune system. So of course, the first barrier of our immune system is your innate immunity. So this is the first defense. These are the real frontliners, uh, include your skin, uh, macrophages, phagocytes, complements, and natural killer cells. So then um, they will um, basically perceive this insult or triggers as an um, antigen and they um, subsequently activate the antigen presenting cells, um, which is your dendritic cells. And this will subsequently activate your adaptive immunity. So your adaptive immunity is the one um, 
uh, that consists of T cells um, and B cells, uh, in which the final products are the autoantibodies, uh, which are produced by B cells. So this actually, this process can uh, already happened even before the clinical manifestation of the autoimmune disease. Eh? So it can happen for many, many years. Eh? Um, so it's considered subclinical or preclinical condition. Uh, and when the, it strikes, um, the, um, the antibodies um, started to attack the organs. So it started to manifest uh, in clinically. Uh, as um, uh, connective tissue disease or rheumatic disease. So, um, so what? How do we use these autoantibodies as diagnostic tools, and what are the pitfalls? So, those um, pathogenesis is just a, an introduction. So, now I will go through the common um, antibody, autoantibody that we usually send um, for screening of uh, connective tissue disease. So, I'm I'm sure that a lot of you have at least ordered this ANA uh, in your life. Huh? So this is um, actually a very useful screening tool uh, to diagnose ANA-associated systemic rheumatic diseases. It is sensitive, uh, but unfortunately not specific as it can also be present in many other non-rheumatic uh, diseases. Huh? For example, other autoimmune which involve other organ like hepatitis, thyroiditis. Uh, okay? And also it can occur in healthy individuals. Uh, so the gold standard um, is um, indirect immunofluorescence, uh, the gold standard, okay, so, and then, but, but here, because I will talk about the pitfalls of this method. Eh? So, so the, the detection method, so we have to be familiar uh, with what are the methods offered in our hospital or in our lab so that we know what are the limitations. So of course, the gold standard has always been the indirect immunofluorescence um, study uh, using the microscopic evaluation. It is very sensitive, um, 97%, uh, but unfortunately less specific, 70%, as compared to the more current technology of immunoassay, this uh, mainly ELISA, I, I'm sure you are very familiar. A lot of, um, I must say that a lot of our Private lab use ELISA because it is uh, less labor intensive. Because for microscopic evaluation, you need a person who are trained um, to see or to evaluate using the microscope. But using ELISA, it's very technical. You just use um, the kit and you can come up with the results. Um, even a technician can do that. So um, the unfortunately with the ELISA, because it is a commercially produced um, um, kit, it has a variable sensitivity. Uh, it can range from uh, 70 to 90%, uh, but it is more specific. Yeah? So yeah, sometimes um, we may need to ask the, lab, the sensitivity and specificity of this uh, ELISA. So of course, in clinical setting, the best is to combine both uh, methods, uh, immunofluorescence as well as the immunoassay, but of course, uh, it will cause incur a, a higher cost. So, and then after looking, um, determining the NA positivity, um, we usually are interested in looking at the titer as well as the pattern, okay? The reason being, um, if you look at this graph, uh, when the titer is lower, I mean less than 320, um, the specificity becomes um, lower. But if, if it's higher, then it, it has... Um, it is, has more um, specificity in, in classifying, especially um, SLD. Okay. And what about the pattern? So, of course, you have, um, these are the common patterns that we see in the reports, right? Homogeneous, um, speckled, nucleolar, and peripheral. So, these patterns um, actually indicates, um, I mean, giving you an idea what are the specific antigens that are they uh, directed to and what are the associated? It is not diagnostic. It is more of association to uh, different types of, uh, uh, of the immune rheumatic diseases. Huh? For example, kalau homogeneous is lupus. If it's speckle, it can be MCTD or even scleroderma. Nucleola is uh, scleroderma and peripheral is more to crest. Okay? 
Uh, so it is recommended that if you have an ANA positive, okay, uh, so it should be confirmed to with extractable nuclear antigen to, to determine what are the specific antigen of this ANA. And also um, myositis specific antibodies, but these are all depending on the clinical features and manifestations. So I think uh, when you order a subsequent test, you have to first look at the clinical uh, and then you, because these tests are very expensive, right? So uh, yeah, it, it is recommended that you proceed with the specific antigen. So either ENA or MSA, depending on your clinical um, assessment. Okay, these are some of the example. Again, what are the associations uh, between the pattern and uh, the uh, specific targets? Uh, for example, uh, homogeneous to the double-stranded DNA, histone, and clusome, and the association with the uh, connective tissue disease. No? But sometimes it can also happen in other, if you look at this cytoplasmic pattern, it can be very non-specific. It can also occur in other condition, no? not necessarily um, rheumatic diseases. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the pitfalls in AE. So, it is a, a very useful um, screening tool, but you must remember um, it is not a perfect um, um, antibody because if you look at this um, data, the uh, it can be present even in general healthy population in up to 13%. Eh? And the commonest specific antigen of this ANA is anti rho and anti la So you probably will see a lot of uh, patients uh, who had you know, extensive uh, medical checkup in private and they come up with a lot of uh, positive NA, NTRO and NTLA, but they are asymptomatic. So, uh, so the interpretation need to be correlated with um, clinical. And number two is discordant test results. Okay, so if you remember that, um, yeah, it is recommended for you to combine immunofluorescence method as um, plus immunoassay method. But what happened if you've got discordant results? One method is negative and one method is, is positive. So how are you going to interpret this? So um, this uh, paper um, described that if, if let's say your immunofluorescence is negative, uh, but your ELISA or immunoassay is positive, it is more uh, chances that the patient actually had an uh, uh, NA associated rheumatic diseases. Because if you remember that um, ELISA method is um, more specific yeah, uh, uh, compared to the uh, immunofluorescence. Uh, but if you have an immunofluorescence positive, but when you checked with the ELISA, it is negative, it make it less likely, uh, not to say um, um, unlikely, but less likely as compared to the case A, yeah? because you see that ANA is very, very sensitive, but it is not specific to autoimmune um, rheumatic diseases. And uh, if you look at this um, uh, study, Actually, the positive predictive value of NA alone for SLE, I'm talking about SLE, is very low. Okay, so uh, so if you look at if if the patient had a very low titer, the positive predictive value is um, less than ten percent. Uh, so the diagnosis depends on the clinical manifestations. Um, so that's why. Um, SLE uh, has classification criteria. So not a single test will be diagnostic of, uh, of the immune, many of the autoimmune rheumatic diseases. And finally, so, so we've learned these four major um, uh, patterns just now, but in real, reality, actually, there are more than 20 in a pattern. So, uh, and it depends on the um, um, competent level. Uh, okay, of the uh, person who, you know, who uh, reads or um, uh, do the immunofluorescence study. studies. So sometimes if you like, you know, you receive the referral for, um, from private lab who may send uh, the uh, test to overseas, you may come across with a weird, weird pattern. So you are not sure what it is. Eh? So, and some of these patterns, the clinical relevance are still not known. Eh? So it's very difficult to interpret. So at, at the end of the day, it's up to the um, clinical manifestation of the patient. And 
And if you come across a patient who had a symptoms of CTD, very suspicious, but ANA negative. So what would you do? Would you send for others um, like if you proceed with ANA? Or so what are you going to do next? So, so um, it is well known that ANA test may be negative initially, especially if you're using the immunofluorescence because um, certain specific antigen um, antibodies, for example, um, anti rho uh, ribosomal P, uh, uh, RNA synthesis, and especially in um, myositis specific antibodies, uh, uh, it is not detected by your usual initial ANA screening. Uh, so in, in some cases, uh, we do send um, for ENA and myositis um, specific antibody. Or you might want to try, I mean, if the initial is using the immunofluorescence, we do repeat and send um, the, the test outside for ELISA and see whether uh, it is positive or not. So ANA negative, but ANA positive um, can be present in up to 7%, but also including non-CTD patients. Eh? All right, so, uh, so extractable nuclear antigens, we have a whole lot of um, specific antigens. Um, and different lab may offer different types of uh, ENAs, uh, and various methods um, uh, are employed, which have um, very wide variability in terms of sensitivity and specificity. Okay, um, but the gold standard is um, gel-based techniques. Uh, but majority is again ELISA. Uh, this is very, um, uh, uh, you know. Um, easy uh, to perform um, using ELISA, but um, the problem is it is um, less specific and has variable sensitivity. So it is very difficult um, if you, uh, you are not sure uh, what type of uh, tests are offered. Um, so, um, but it is very useful eh, as a complement um, uh, in patients who had ANA uh, positive. Of course, um, they um, it is recommended to, to do in a two different methods like your ANA, um, but we don't in practical in real life we don't do this because it's very expensive and um, um, so we just use whatever um, platform that is offered uh, in our lab so these are the examples of the associations of this extractable nuclear antigens with various um, autoimmune um, rheumatic diseases i just want to highlight that this ntdfs 70 it's very common in healthy populations. In fact, some studies state that if this is positive, it is unlikely to be SLE in the absence of other SLE-related autoantibodies. Like if it's just isolated NTDFS70 positive. Anti double strand DNA, yeah. So this is a very uh, 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 you know antibody that is um, uh, checked in patients with lupus because it is very specific. 97%, but because of the low sensitivity, we don't use this as your screening tool, okay? Uh, because you might miss 40% uh, of SLD patients if you just check for anti double strand DNA. But it does have a predictor for renal uh, involvement, uh, but it's still not 100% specific as it can be present in patients with multiple comorbids, uh, malignancies, and even infection. All right, so, uh, so this is, uh, so like I've mentioned, first you send ANA, and then if it's positive, you want to consider sending ENA for further um, uh, uh, stratification and also double strand DNA. And if it's all negative, then you might want to think of myositis specific antibodies, okay? The reason being, uh, actually, uh, they can present be present even without, um, uh, myositis, uh, what we call sign myositis. So, for example, in a patient who had vasculitic rash, uh, vasculitis, or bad lung, uh, ILD, but they don't have uh, muscle pain, myositis, uh, but these are this can be a manifestations of uh, the spectrum in the spectrum of uh, myositis. Uh. So again, there are a lot of um, antibodies in this panel, uh, and it's not widely available. Uh, I mean, in our hospital, we have to send outside as well. Uh, but it is very useful um, because uh, it can have a predilection to a certain um, manifestation. Uh, for example, if you have an MTA positive, you have to be very careful. It is associated with a very bad lung disease. 
Uh, and if TIF1 or NXP2 positive, we have to look hard for malignancy. Yeah? So sometimes we end up doing um, upper GI scope, low GI scope, CT, thorax, and valve, and a lot of things yeah? just to make sure that we don't miss uh, malignancy. Okay? So those are the examples of um, MSA. All right, so these are the one of the earliest autoantibody that is discovered yeah, in, in, uh, in, in the field of rheumatology, rheumatoid factor. It is actually uh, antibodies that are directed against the FC region of immunoglobulin G. So it's the commonest that we do here um, is IgM, but um, we, I mean, rheumatoid factor can be in the form of IgE or IgG. Uh, but the problem with this um, rheumatoid factor, it is very non-specific. So it can also happen in infection, healthy individuals, and other chronic diseases. Eh? And uh, it is not a pathognomony of rheumatoid arthritis, although the name is rheumatoid, because it can also present in other connective tissue diseases like SLE, Sjogren's, uh, myositis, eh? and even in cryoglobulinemia. So NTCCP is more uh, a better predictor of uh, rheumatoid arthritis eh, as compared to uh, rheumatoid factor eh, because, but this one is newly discovered. I mean, uh, not more than, I mean, around a decade ago. All right, um, it has a very high specificity of rheumatoid arthritis, about ninety eight percent. But unfortunately, it only present in thirty to sixty percent of our patients. Eh? So, uh, it is not. Um, I mean up to only half of our patients do not have this um, NTCCP. How about vasculitis? Eh? Okay, so vasculitis, um, based on the classification of the Chapel Hill, they classify according to the size. Okay, um, So it is not classified based um, purely based on the presence of autoantibodies. Eh? So that's why in vasculitis, you can have a seronegative vasculitis, eh? for example, in medium and large vessel. Uh, and small vessels mainly can have um, out their own autoantibodies. Eh? The, uh, you know, this um, ANCA vasculitis is more common, okay, in the form of uh, microscopic polyangitis or GPA or eosinophilic granulomatosis or called uh, chick straws. Uh, anti-glomerular basement membrane disease, so this is very specific antibody to GBM. Uh, but immune complex small vessel vasculitis um, uh, mainly um, is very non-specific yeah, because, for example, a rheumatoid factor in cryoglobulinemic uh, vasculitis. So for ANCA, similar with your ANE, the gold standard is immunofluorescence so that you can determine um, the pattern uh, of the uh, ANCA. So it's either cytoplasmic or perinuclear staining. Um, however, um, this C and P ANCA is not specific. Yeah? So you need to proceed with the antigen specific using ELISA. So there are two step methods that you need to do if you want to um, diagnose uh, NCA-associated vasculitis. Né? So you need to determine whether these are uh, directed towards uh, proteinase 3 or PR3 ANCA, which uh, can be found in up to 80% of patients with Wegener's uh, or uh, granulomatous uh, polyangitis, or uh, NPO ANCA or myeloproxidase, uh, which can uh, commonly happen in um, uh, NPO and chick straws. Né? There are other uh, target antigens uh, such as elastase, catepsin G, and uh, these uh, antigens are not really related to uh, immune rheumatic disease. So for us, it's more of PR3 or MPO. But again, uh, similar with other autoantibodies, it, it, it is non-specific yeah, to uh, uh, ANCA vasculitis uh, because it can also happen in drug-induced condition. Yeah. Uh, so drug eaters, for example, anti-TB, anti-thyroid, antibiotics. Uh, and it can also occur in many other autoimmune diseases, uh, not necessarily your uh, Wegener's or chick strauss uh, for example, um, inflammatory bowel disease, SLE. Uh, and most importantly, don't forget about the mimickers, uh, malignancy uh, and infections. Uh, so these are the common um, differential diagnoses of uh, positive 
autoantibodies in, in rheumatology. So, and next we looked into the pregnancy because these are also very common scenario. Um, you probably will receive the referral um, pregnant lady who probably had a routine medical checkup and a complete package of ANA and ENA. So then suddenly they have anti row and anti la So how are you going to interpret this? So of course, clinical manifestation first, all right? But like I've mentioned before, uh, it is very common to have, not very common, um, in healthy individuals, if they have ANA positive, the commonest um, um, antigens is against anti row and anti la So they may be asymptomatic. Uh, it's just that for pregnant women, um, so we need to look at the history uh, of symptoms of connective tissue disease. So al although they may not have the diagnosis um, of SLE or any CTD, but if let's say these women give birth to a baby with neonatal lupus, they are at risk of having future connective tissue disease. Yeah? And what about the, the fetus? So we look back at the pregnancy history. If the patient had history of, you know, unexplained uh, neonatal de death or uh, congenital heart block, uh, it can be due to uh, this condition, uh, congenital heart block secondary to anterior and antilla, in which have a high re recurrent risk, uh, up to 25%. So we can recommend um, uh, frequent uh, weekly monitoring uh, of the fetal heart rate from 18 weeks. And if you have a fetal maternal uh, um, clinic or specialist can refer for fetal ultrasound and hydroxychloroquine can be offered uh, to this uh, mom if they have a prior history of uh, suggestive of uh, congenital heart problem. And of course, when the baby suddenly um, born with a rash, okay, then of um, you should think of this uh, NLS eh? because the patient may be, I mean, the mom can be asymptomatic. Eh? It's just that the, the, the antibody cross the placenta and causing skin rash or neonatal lupus syndrome in the baby. Antiphospholipid antibodies are also one of the antibodies that you may encounter, um, especially usually by ONG referral eh? um, for a patient who had uh, poor uh, obstetric history, recurrent miscarriage. Yeah? Okay, so there are at the moment um, three types of uh, antiphospholipid antibodies available: uh, lupus anticoagulant, anticardiolipin, and anti-beta two GP one. Uh, but you must remember that the, this presence of antiphospholipid antibodies in the absence of any clinical manifestation still do not fulfill. APLS uh, syndrome, uh, because kalau you sebut syndrome, it has to be at least either a pregnancy morbidity or presence of thrombosis. And again, similar with other autoantibodies, do not forget about the mimickers, uh, infection, comorbidities, malignancies, and seronegative APLS still present, patient had uh, recurrent arterial thrombus and then all probably very bad obstetric history, unexplained lie. Um, so this seronegative meaning that um, there are other non-criteria uh, which are not available in our um, centre or in, even in our country, but it is done in other um, more well-developed or well-resourced countries, eh? more, more antibodies. Eh? So now after learning with all the different types of autoantibodies can be very confusing and you have to interpret this antibody in clinical setting. Okay, so I'm going to bring back to the pathogenesis of autoantibody production. If you can remember that this immune dysregulation can happen for many, many years, even before the clinical manifestation arises. So the interpretation of autoantibodies really depend on when the patient did the screening, okay? Uh, because I found that a lot of private hospitals, uh, they like to offer uh, full packages of medical screening, uh, which includes rheumatoid factor, ANA, and, and you need to determine um, whether these are indeed at the stage of preclinical disease uh, or probably incomplete disease eh? because uh, it is an evolving, eh? autoimmune rheumatic disease is an evolving, evolving disease. Eh? Start off with immune dysregulation and probably after 
multiple years, then it will start to develop symptoms, but probably not fulfill the classification criteria. And after several years, then you will develop a full blown disease and unfortunately irreversible tissue damage. But to be honest, we're still um, not sure who will progress, who will not progress and when exactly they will progress. Huh? So it is very difficult um, for us to, you know, to determine um, uh, exactly. Uh, but of course, there are some emerging research looking at the clinical characteristic that can predict you know, who will subsequently progress into a full classification criteria. And there are uh, there is an ongoing trial which showed that hydroxychloroquine uh, may delay the full blown SLA onset. Eh? Uh, in patients who had probably some minimal symptoms but um, positive autoantibodies, but this is still in ongoing trial. So same with rheumatoid factor, yeah. So you came and I um, mean you were referred with a patient RF positive patient as well. So either he is in this risks uh, stage. So of course primary prevention: stop smoking because you know smoking is very bad can induce autoimmunity and probably um, healthy diets, lah, mainly anti-inflammatory omega-3 fish. Okay, hopefully we'll stop this progression into subclinical inflammation uh, or an undifferentiated and finally fulfill the criteria. Okay, so if you understand uh, the progression, so you have to determine at what stage the patient present to you, whether it's at risk stage, subclinical stage, or undifferentiate, or meaning that very minimal symptoms, but not fulfilled. Okay. All right. So, and then, of course, in a very early, very early systemic sclerosis, or what we call VDOS. Okay. So, you may not want to miss it. So, mainly NA positive, puffy hands. So, puffy hands is very confusing eh? because sometimes your hands can get puffy. Uh, and presence of Raynaud's, these are very suggestive of early systemic sclerosis. So sometimes, if you are not sure, because Raynaud's sometimes very difficult to visualize in clinics, I mean, probably because um, it's already disappeared, you can actually um, refer um, for um, to look at the nail fold capillaroscope. There are a few centers who have uh, which has this facility. Yeah? So if abnormal, uh, nail for capillaroscopic pattern, so it is suggestive of um, systemic sclerosis. The reason being we want to catch them early is because edematous phase of systemic sclerosis is reversible, huh? so you can prevent uh, sclerosis basically. And of course, in clinical setting, there are hundreds of classification criteria, so it's like rheumatology has nothing else to bring except your apps. Calculate to calculate whether this patient had SLE or RA or scleroderma or vasculitis or even gout. Eh? In gout, pun ada classification criteria. So it, it is impossible to remember all the classification criteria. But I want you all to re remember this classification criteria is not diagnostic. Eh? It's not diagnostic. It's, it's just to assist you in classifying the patient. And these criteria are developed mainly for research purposes. Uh, the only, I mean, one of that I can think of diagnostic is if you got a renal biopsy, which showed a full house uh, and complement deposition, IgG, IgA, and all that. So it is diagnostic of lupus nephritis. This is the only one. So even in vasculitis, if you have a biopsy, because we do not have the uh, immune specific staining. Uh, so that's why in, in vasculitis, um, it's very difficult. To diagnose, um, interpret histologically. So again, in reality, we use a lot of our left uh, brain uh, with a lot of scientific information. Uh, we have learned on the pathogenesis of autoantibodies, all sort of hundreds of autoantibodies positive, how to interpret and all that. But we, we as a physician, I think we should also use our right brain it's uh, i think medicine has always been a balance between science and art because the interpretation and the judgment really depends on your experience and most importantly the communication uh, not only to the patients uh, so that you can alleviate and reassure um, give a proper reassurance proper counseling and also with your peers 
Okay, um, I'm sure that you will receive a lot of referrals with these positive antibodies and sometimes it can get your nerves. So yeah, so these are the most important thing that we probably need to learn by experience. So accepting referrals, I would always equivate with uh, phases of uh, grieving. Um, masa, I mean, probably many, many years ago when I was um, MO, even um, specialist, the initial part of it is mainly denial. You know, when you accept referral, you say, oh, unlikely, unlikely. And then you have a bit of anger and probably depressed. A lot of referrals are coming in. Uh, but with, um, uh, and then when you become more experienced and you start to bargain, you know, uh, and then you say, okay, okay, I will review after you have done this test, this test come back. And hopefully, I mean, maybe you were thinking the tests are not it readily available, probably some of them will come back after a month or probably never come back at all, lost, uh, the sample got lost. And I think with experience, then you started to embrace um, this um, referrals or consultations and um, try to accept and interpret appropriately. So I think um, these are the common evolution. I think everybody goes through this. Um, but sometimes still, even when you are already a specialist, um, you go back to the, you know, this anger, and depression, especially when you received an, um, you know, inappropriate referrals. And but I would like to advise all, um, respect your referees. I mean, you know, these are, they are trying to get help um, and your opinion on the uh, clinical and patients, for the patient's interest. And um, we are, as a rheumatology, we are not really obsessed with autoantibodies because we know that they are seronegative diseases. So that's why um, clinical uh, skills is very important. So uh, rheumatic diseases is a spectrum uh, depending on what type of immune pathway uh, are the main uh, pathogenesis of the disease. So if you see that... Um, Seronegative disease can be in the form of spondyloarthritis, like your ankylosing spondylitis, uh, okay, psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, uveitis, vaches, okay, so, and even in, in patients with seropositive disease, some of them still have negative, for example, anka negative vasculitis, okay, or even in myositis, you don't express any uh, of the antibodies and so on. So I think the clinical uh, correlation is very important uh, when dealing with patients with rheumatic diseases. So if you're not sure, if you're not sure, I mean, compose yourself and make a good referral. Okay, so we always ask about the clinical uh, aspect of the patient rather than focusing on the antibodies alone. So what are the future direction um, in uh, autoantibodies? So of course, autoantibodies plays uh, important roles for us to diagnose uh, patients with uh, rheumatic diseases. But now there are a lot of other aspects. How do we want to prevent? Because it is an evolution, right? How do we want to prevent this from progressing? So of course, the symptoms, the environmental history. Yeah? So for example, smoking, family history, because genetics has been um, one of the important factors, right? And some of them, some of the population have come up with the genetic risk score based on the genetic studies. Uh, and advanced imaging, uh, advanced imaging, for example, MRI and ultrasound may help in a very early arthritis. Okay? And there are emerging novel biomarkers uh, like your interferon signatures. So this is for patients with SLE mainly, uh, or patients with AMA positive without symptoms. You so um, in, in the UK, they did a study and when they found that these interferon signatures are high in ANA positive asymptomatic patients, they are at risk of developing SLE in the future. So in summary, uh, autoantibodies assist in the diagnosis of, uh, of the immune rheumatic diseases uh, and classification criteria in rheumatology are depending on the clinical correlation and always be aware of the mimickers, uh, for example, infection and malignancy. And commonly, uh, infection and connective tissue disease can occur together, uh, even malignancy. So we have to treat both. And remember this pre-disease autoantibodies concept, especially if you are dealing with patients who had 
uh, positive on to of the antibodies but has no symptoms. All right. So, and please remember that negative autoantibodies or seronegativity does not exclude immune-mediated uh, rheumatic diseases. So, at the end of the day, we have to take a complete history, do a proper physical examination, and complement this with laboratory tests as well as imaging. So, I just want to share this video clip. I find it very funny. Oh, hey, Bill, come on in. What do you got? I have a very interesting patient. Bill, there's a history of joint pain. Bill, I ordered an unnecessary AMA and I was positive and I don't know what to do. Everything's... Okay, so I think that's all from me. I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Cheryl, uh, for uh, an enlightening and comprehensive uh, talk regarding uh, autoantibodies in rheumatology. I think if you look at uh, Prof. Cheryl's uh, summary slides, I think that's the essence of um, things uh, when we talk about autoantibodies in connective tissue disease. Most important thing is if you don't have feature or connective tissue disease, that, or, 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 or any clinical sign and symptoms that might suggest this patient has connective tissue disease, autoantibody may not help you in any way, right? Uh, there's so many autoantibody, you just don't get confused. Uh, there's so many classification criteria, but whatever it is, the right-hand corner is very, very important. History, physical examination, lab test and imaging. So now we come to the Q&A session. You still can post your questions in the chat box. Uh, so far, we have four uh, uh, questions already in, yeah, Cheryl? Uh, oh, so okay. the, first, uh, the first question is uh, uh, by Kamala Kanan. Uh, he, had, he, he had a patient with anti-nuclear antibody of 1,280, speckled pattern. How do we manage your views having symptoms of how we how do we manage your views having symptoms of joint pain? So some, probably someone with joint pain and mm. anti-nuclear antibody is one uh, one two one eight zero speckled pattern. How do we go from there? Okay, so um so basically uh this is a very high title. Okay, I do agree, and the patient have joint pain. So we we have to determine what are the nature of the joint pain. So is it mechanical? Is it inflammatory? Uh, is it arthralgia, meaning just pain in the absence of swelling or inflammation, or is it indeed an arthritis? Because uh, if, let's say, this is a young patient, with even with arthralgia, uh, you, this could be an early arthritis or even early uh, SLE or CTD, uh, because you know these are evolving disease, right? So, so and she, I mean, the patient has symptoms. It's not like totally asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, if you look at the, um, the, the slides before that I've shown that um, first you have an antibodies, but no symptoms, then you can progress to early symptoms, but do not fulfill the classification criteria. There are some roles, but um, not, uh, not to say strong evidence, okay? Uh, to uh, initiate treatment, for example, if the patient um, probably incomplete lupus, uh, you may want to offer hydroxychloroquine, but you have to tell the patient uh, this is something not a strong evidence eh, because there's no randomized control trial. Huh? Uh, so I think this, the decision has to be made by the consultant rheumatologist. Now, I mean, do not bear the responsibilities. Yeah? So Please, please, please discuss. Okay, in in borderline case lah. I'm talking about borderline case. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. because sometimes, uh, if if you, a lot of times you also have this kind of case, we really have to look, uh, in and out every nooks and corner to yeah. look for evidence means that might suggest suddenly ada satu discolition there, satu oh, discolition kat situ. <laughs> so, right, I mean. Try yeah. to fulfill the criteria. Send double strand DNA, ENA, C two C four. And you might surprise me, they are the full house, the authentic yeah, bodies. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, those are the things yeah. that you do. Mm -hmm. okay. So, the next question is from Hashima. Hashima is from Bali. His Hashima is a rheumatologist in Bali now. What is the significance of atypical P anka? Um, mm. Is it significant clinically for rheumatological disease? Uh, atypical P anka is non specific. 
that's number one lah. I can present in many other conditions. So it's very difficult to interpret if no symptoms. Mm -hmm. So I need a good history lah. I mean, if let's say the history is suggestive, it is possible that it is a pathogenic antibody for rheumatic, those particular symptoms. But if the symptoms is not suggestive of any rheumatological diseases, then um, so it may just a bystander, meaning that it's very non-specific. It's just so happened uh, it is positive, but it doesn't cause any uh, disease. Mm -hmm. So I think history and I mean go back to clinical. So wait. Same uh, MPO, I mean, in rheumatology, we have a more um, uh, specificity for PR3 and MPO, mm -hmm. which is your NCA associated vasculitis, but not other types of us, um, NCA. Because I think this atypical PRNCA was the one they discovered for, for GI, isn't it? GI, mm -hmm. some subpatient with inflammatory bowel disease, they find that this patient have atypical PRNCA. Really, I also... Uh, if the patient has no clinical findings mm. suggestive connective tissue disease, I wouldn't uh, anchor upon. So we wouldn't really know whether this atypical P anchor has an association with um, rheumatological condition. Maybe kalau Hashim baru balik daripada uh, uh, Australia, other 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 facts on this or things to share, maybe you can type in the in the chat box so that uh, we can also learn from you. Mm. Um, the third question is. Um, do you send antiphospholipid antibody uh, in all SLE patients? Often we see SLE patients have secondary uh, APL with or without syndrome. Do we need to screen early uh, at SLE diagnosis or only send when we suspect APLS or thrombosis or obstetric complications? Okay, so if you ask a rheumatologist, yes, I think most would prefer to send antiphospholipid antibody. The reason being, uh, there is a uh, small studies, I mean, recommendation to give prophylaxis aspirin in patients with SLE and positive antiphospholipid antibodies to prevent thrombosis. Uh, but against the level of evidence is not great because there's no randomized control trial, but it, we can still offer aspirin treatment for these patients. Secondly, uh, if these are young patients potentially getting pregnant, we can give a proper counseling for the pregnancy. And thirdly, you have an option to wait for thrombosis to happen, but you know once the patient is already on anticoagulation or warfarin, it is impossible for you to send the full sets of antiphospholipid antibody because it will interfere with the interpretation of your lupus anticoagulant. I mean, so we usually, if the patient um, is willing to screen, we encourage or recommend them to screen. But of course, if you ask hematologists, um, they don't really agree to send uh, antiphospholipid antibodies because it is an expensive test. And sometimes it, it is uh, very technical, very difficult to do. Okay, so but if you ask rheumatologist, if you ask me, I would encourage them and recommend. Mm -hmm. So for risk stratification of thrombosis and pregnancy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, some of in, in our classification criteria, uh, one of the antibodies that are there is uh, this antiphospholipid antibodies, can? Uh, okay, uh, a question from Dr. Muhammad Faisal, who is a pathologist, uh, microbiology from police. Uh, his question, uh, there are a few questions from him. The first question is, can immunosuppressive or steroids affect CTD screening? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, basically you do screening, usually you send ANA, right? ANA and, and rheumatoid factor, right? In some cases, yes, uh, in a form of high dose of steroids, it can temporarily make the ANA negative. Okay, so that's why sometimes, um, I mean, uh, but actually, to be honest, we don't recommend, once the ANA is positive, when, when you start steroid, we don't recommend you to repeat the ANA. It, it is not part of the disease activity indicator. It's not a good disease activity indicator. But to answer that question, whether immunosuppressive or stroke can affect the ANA, yes. In some patients, it can temporarily be negative for a while and then it will be positive again. Yeah, betul, betul. Because we don't, we don't, we don't 
monitor kan probably if you want to monitor maybe CT, uh, anti double stranded DNA lah yes. uh, which can up and down with the disactivity yeah. in, in particular yes. lupus arthritis even remote factor or apa pun we don't monitor the the, the titer All right. So the second question from Dr. Muhammad Faisal is in view of uh, ANA ELISA is more specific but less sensitive. Would you still want to request immunofluorescence for uh, CTD testing? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kalau ini depends on lab. So selalunya yeah. I akan tanya my lab lah, my apa immunology friend. Uh, you punya Eliza ni okay ke, tak okay ke? Do you think we need to proceed with IRF or they are confident with it? So uh, yeah, it's all communication because kalau if you talk about gold standard, memang they require IIF positive. Tapi if let's say um, your kid uh, in the hospital too memang have good uh, sensitivity and specificity, then we will follow the recommendation by the immunologist. Mm -mm, yeah. Better, yeah. Because it's very, it's very labor intensive kind to do. Right? You have to, mm -hmm. yeah. We will happy kalau dapat yang more specific. <laughs> I mean, the whole standard has always been apa dia kata combine lah IIF uh, apa semua tu. Tapi kita tak cukup. I mean, we don't have enough resources sometimes. So still your uh, the clinical clinical manifestation. Uh, I think clinical is... kan because NA is just satu markah je betul tak? That's mm -hmm, betul one markah je. <laughs> okay, uh, alright. Third question uh, by Dr. Faisal. Uh, hmm. If angka immunofluorescent are uh, positive. Uh, P or C positive, but MPO and PR3 uh, negative, would you still treat as AAV? Angkat uh, sensitive uh, vasculitis? Betul, betul. Kalau dia clinical fit, the uh, angkat vasculitis, yes, we do treat because if you look at the uh, sensitivity for even for uh, wagoners pun 80% saja yang mm, positive. Uh, Mm -hmm. Ah, positive si angka tu and lower even in check straw so yeah we still treat clinical yeah, yeah. provided it fulfills it, it, it has all the clinical features we make a important thing is whether we can make a diagnosis whether this is AAV ataupun vasculitis ke apa mm -hmm. ke whatever that we have got even the MPO PR3 negative we still treat but if it's positive lagi bagus kan correct mm -hmm. okay another question hi prof a patient's rheumatoid factor had been negative for the past few years. Patient is asymptomatic, but mother has rheumatoid factor positive and symptomatic recently. This patient's rheumatoid factor turned out to be positive, but asymptomatic. Okay, may oh. I know, should this patient proceed for further tests? Thank you, Frog. So what happened is that mother did am positive. Uh, symptomatic recently. This patient's uh, punya rheumatoid factor previously were negative and now become positive. But, but it's still it's asymptomatic. Ah, uh, still asymptomatic. So what do, do we need to proceed for further tests? Okay. So uh, so there are two patients lah in this scenario. Eh? Mm, so I yes. just want to address the mother first lah. So the mother rheumatoid factor positive and symptomatic. symptomatic. So the symptoms though. Ah, uh, symptoms so I nak tahu memang betul betul uh, RE ke OE ke. Okay, mm -hmm. so if if let's say, for example, the mother confirmed RE, I mean confirmed by rheumatologist uh, RE zero positive, okay, and the patient uh, suddenly rheumatoid factor positive, but is symptomatic, actually, yeah, I won't proceed to any further tests because it's still the symptoms, eh? you see, because you know you already had a genetic to this immune dysregulation from your mother, okay, so it's likely that probably something triggered it to uh, um, happen, your rheumatoid factor suddenly turned to be positive, but it may not cause any problem yet. So to determine whether you, you will progress to uh, RA in the near future, okay, so there are some recommendation by uh, EULA uh, on to re-stratify whether you will progress. Eh? Uh, tapi in that Yula pun still kena ada sedikit symptoms because I think we don't want to cause any anxiety. Okay, any anxiety macam contohnya I suruh you pergi buat all the anti-CCP, ANA lah apa semua and then positive semua. Tapi tak ada symptom pun and it will create a lot of anxiety and then you will be symptomatic because of stress. Okay, so and then suddenly you will be labeled as this autoimmune disease and received a lot of treatment which has some side effects. So 
in, even in EULA, they need at least some symptoms for us to further risk stratify. Kalau dah ada symptom joint pain, for example, uh, then of course we want to do anti-CCP uh, and uh, maybe an ultrasound to look for subclinical inflammation. And kalau betul-betul ada, then we will say, oh, look, you are at risk. There are study which offer methotrexate to prevent uh, full progression to RE. But you have to accept that these medications has their side effects. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, so, Jane. Yes, yes. Um, and now we are going to the concept of very, very early rheumatoid arthritis. Ah, very, very, very early. Vera. <laughs> uh, but still, out of those young artists, Vera, suspected to have Vera, 80% will probably return back to normal. Uh, so seriously, it's really clinical plus uh, uh, the presence of uh, autoantibodies that we proceed. Okay, the next one is polypus. If we have started on hydroxychloroquine and prednisolone, how long do we keep these drugs for these patients and the duration? Can we stop after some times? Okay, so mm -hmm. yeah, um, hydroxychloroquine is recommended to be continued on uh, lifelong lah, basically and unless the patient developed um, complications but of course you have to monitor the toxic, bukan, uh, toxicity it's macam long term use of doxycycline uh, associated with uh, maculopathy so can the ophthalmology referral especially for those who are on it for more than 5 years uh, prednisolone too depends actually because definitely we want to taper as early as possible so, yang ni memang uh, depends on the patient's situation. If the patient is already in remission, uh, uh, okay, for example, I usually stratify according to the manifestation. Now, if it's major organ involvement, you may want to keep PrEP for a longer period, but very low dose, nah, less than 7.5 milligrams or less than 5 milligrams per day for at least two to three years nah, in remission, then you want to taper off. But if it's just... um. Uh, minor, bukan lah minor, uh, not major organ involvement, eh? for example, skin, uh, joints, okay, so you may want to taper faster within months to one year. I mean, yeah. Um, yeah, but this really depends on the clinical disability. Yeah, betul. Yeah, great. Uh, any other questions from the uh, participant? Hmm. Kalau tak ada, I think we are on time. <laughs> uh, also almost three o'clock. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Prof. Sharol, for your talk and entertaining uh, and answering all the questions. Uh, thank you, a College of Physician, uh, for for inviting us, the rheumatology uh, team, uh, fraternity, for this December uh, uh, December webinars. Uh, thank you to the attendees. Thank you for those uh, to those who ask questions. Hope you um, are satisfied with the answer that we've given. Um, I, I think uh, with that, uh, thank you very much. We'll end the session uh, today. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Calvin. Yeah, thanks again, Prof. Shara, for the talk and Dr. Asma for the chairing the session. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye. bye.